Hello everyone, welcome to my shop, I'm Robin and today we're starting on the surface plate lapping that I'm doing on this 3 foot by 4 foot Master Pink uh, granite plate. Uh, I got this because it was worn out too far and the relappers uh, didn't want to touch it. They started on it I think and, and uh, said they gave up on it and said it was too far going. So I got it for free. And um, you've seen other videos on me building the stand and now it's time to actually lap the plate. Uh, you're following along on my learning curve. I have not done this before. I've seen lots of plates being lapped. I understand the principles, but haven't actually done it. So uh, you're following along on my learning curve, and I'm going to show you the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, currently, this video is just going to cover roughing, and it probably won't even get done to roughing, but we're going to see a lot of things on how I'm measuring using a precision level. Uh, I have a gauge that I've made, the Renzimeter, which will be a separate uh, video which is a repeat reading gauge and straightness gauge that's self-calibrating. Uh, possibly a new instrument. I still kind of doubt it, but uh, I don't think it's... I've never seen one. So um, self-calibrating for straightness uh, inherently and measures to uh, extremely low levels with electronic gauging in it. So I'm not using that now. So I'm just letting you know that's coming up and when it's mentioned, when you have a hunch of what it was. Uh, the, this 10 by 30 plate is what I'm using. I've had this kicking around the shop forever. Uh, I'm using this uh, for my roughing initially, uh, so that's what you'll be seeing me using in this. And it has advantages, and the long 30 inch length is good for bridging and averaging uh, and getting rid of whoop de doos. Uh, but it's narrow width, it'd be nicer if this was a little wider, but I think we'll, we'll live with that. If I have other plates I'll be using. Uh, I'm going to be using the term charge a lot in here, and in lapping, that means when the particles have been pressed into the lap where they are stuck. And they're embedded, and they're in embedded enough that when you turn it over and use it as a as a as an abrasive tool, they're in there strong enough that they stay in and and work, and not just fall out and roll around. Charge is opposed to free abrasive, where the particles are loose and tumble, and that is a legitimate uh, lapping action. There's two different categories there: charged and free abrasive. And you'll see in here we're going to start off with trying to do just a pure charge, and then I find it's not all that important, and I'm actually getting better cutting action by. Still charging it, meaning I'm rolling the, the particles in, pressing them in with a roller, um, but leaving some of the free abrasives on there. Um, there are, most of the places on where I'm speaking, I've sped it up at least 1.2 times. Uh, I'm an impatient person. I like to make videos that are uh, content dense, and I don't like wasted time on videos when I watch them, so I'm very uh, conscious of trying to make them uh, be nonstop information that if you blink, you'll miss it. So if this bothers you on here, remember that on YouTube you can actually slow down uh, the videos as well as speed them up, the playback speed. So if it bothers you, you can actually uh, kick back on the, um, it's, I think it's a good compromise. It's fast enough that it's not like Mickey Mouse, but it speeds it up enough that we're, we're uh, zipping along at a nice pace. The sections where I'm using the level, you see me actually using the level and moving it and positioning it. I have cut out all the wait time for the level to settle. These bubbles take time to actually settle in and get to an established position. I've trimmed all that that time out of there. So don't think when I, you see me doing these, and some of those are sped up very fast, uh, six, eight, eight times speed, ten times speed, uh, because I don't want uh, to waste the time there. But when you see these, you'll see that the time that I'm, um, I cut the time out when the bubble's settling. So remember that when you're actually doing these, when that when you move that level, you have to give it a good 30 seconds, minute sometimes, for the bubble to actually creep into position. Um, I don't know how many videos this is going to take. Um, I'm thinking maybe three, four, uh, and um, if you are using these videos as an actual learning tool on how to do it, uh, there are places where I'm explaining uh, aspects of lapping and geometry and changing things. Uh, I would suggest not fast forwarding if you're actually trying to, to learn the content that I have in here. Um, I try to make everything I have in here of value uh, with the minimum amount of um, babbling. Uh, so if you're if you're out for that, um, don't fast forward because you're gonna miss some some details. So let's get on with it. Here's our embedding roller. This is a hardened A2 uh, piece with a spherical uh, double row spherical ball bearing. So this can flex. So I can put this on, put my body pressure on here, and physically crush, uh, embed the diamond particles into the cast iron lap. So this is so that it gets a good charge, and we don't have any free abrasive. Everything is charged into the plate. I'm going to start to rough this plate since I'm pretty sure that it's severely out of shape because that's why I got the plate because the relappers wouldn't uh, wouldn't work on it. And I'm starting with 325-400 which is relatively coarse 
and I'm gonna use this. And so we're gonna charge this plate right now. I'm gonna try to use some, uh, all this is experimentation on the fly here. Okay, I'm gonna try using some alcohol as just a fluid medium and a uh, fantail brush, uh, as you see right here. And purpose, or my thinking on this is that since these bristles are, are basically almost like a single layer, instead of a regular brush where the particles will tend to carry and hold the abrasive particles. This is just going to distribute them. I'm going to be able to swish this around and try to get somewhat of an even coat of the diamond on there uh, with the alcohol before I start rolling. So I'm going to flip this up so we can see the whole thing and uh, give it a whirl. So we're going to wipe this thing off. I've alcohol this off real well. And I've got some diamond in here that I cleaned off with another plate when I was just experimenting with this to see how coarse it was. And I'm just seeing what this, what this does. i kind of rinse this out. Try to get this diamond out onto the plate here. I'm just going to Use this brush to swirl the, the diamond around. See if this will give me a somewhat of an even coating of, uh, of diamond. I don't think I have enough, but here's some more in here. This is still clinging to the plastic. And I'm gonna open up the pouch and get a little more on here. I don't wanna overdo it. I just wanna get a, a, a gentle dusting on here that will give us a good charge, good uniform charge over the, over the whole thing. Trying to get a little, a little bit on here. Excuse my head if it's if it happens to be getting in there. Let's see what that does. And some alcohol here to float things. And we're gonna just try to smear this around. You can hear the diamond scratching, scratchy sound there. The diamond pulling it around. Basically trying to get a nice reasonably uniform layer on here that we can then roll in, varying our directions. And the alcohol beauty of that is it'll just evaporate and leave the residue. So now we're going to wipe our roller off, and I'm just going to start. I have my 50 millionth best test sitting on a block that has three carbide feet and the silicon nitride ball is on here for a, for a, a gauge point and I'm just showing you that here we've got what is relatively straight so we we see that there's that's you know the, the plates going not going to be crazy far out um, I've already taken a couple passes on here with the long 10 by 30 plate that I just happen to have laying around been been kicking it around in the in the corners for years and finally came to be useful. But now I'm going to come over here to where I know I've got an issue. Right here, I can see this band. I thought it was just a rust band, but it's rusty because that's where the water laid in it when it was outside all the time. So this is the same zero we had from before. A little bigger. So this is out here. You can see where. Yeah, that's where it's really bad. So we're just going to have to uh, whack this down until that goes away. You can actually see this uh, as you're lapping. This also, this is shiny, still shiny from the wear, and this rough surface that's been roughed with the 325-400 uh, grit diamond powder um, is kind of matte and uh, it's not super crazy coarse, but it's it's not a, not a not a shiny finish. Here, from this grazing angle, you can see this big subtle low spot here. And then the deep one that we were looking at there, the color change where it's just not being abraded by the, the diamond powder. Instead of hoisting this thing up each time to uh, charge, I'm going to break loose and put cardboard here to roll over on. And then I can recharge this. I'm clean this off with some alcohol. Keep in mind here, I have no 
experience, actual experience in lapping surface plates other than watching it and uh, watching people do it and using a little bit of uh, know-how of general lapping knowledge. So I'm not saying that, like, I, you know, I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. I'm just saying don't take this as there are people that do this for a living are going to scoff and, you know, say, ah. guys, a nitwit, and, uh, which is fine and probably true. Um, but just just a, a warning to to realize that what I'm doing may not be optimum. I mean, I, I guarantee you I'm going to get this plate done. Uh, it just might not be the most orthodox methods or, uh, you know, the, the best practices. But um, other than, I mean, we, we've seen plenty of videos on, on, on doing it, and it's pretty much pretty much going to boil down to just good general lapping techniques and understanding of uh, understanding of how these abrasives behave. So now we're trying to roll, roll the charge in here. So the outside of this roller is all coated in diamond. And I'm not disturbing that, not wiping it off, just letting it sit on there. I'm going to try leaving that on. I'll spread that back out. I'm going to try leaving that on and just see what, how that behaves with just a trifle of uh, free abrasives in there. The more free abrasives there are, they're not embedded into the plate, acting like a bonded grinding wheel, the more wear you're going to get on the plate. Because you're going to get tumbling action as opposed to just the uh, cutting action of a particle that's embedded in and rigidly held in the in the uh, in the plate. So this should sound pretty crispy. Crash start in here. I'm gonna take a quick quick run down the plate here and get stuff. One technique, as you use this and you skate off the ends in the middle, preferentially, since when this comes off here, this isn't working, this still is. Same here on this side. This isn't working, this is. You're preferentially going to wear this plate to be concave. As in all lapping, upper plate's going to get concave, lower plate's going to get convex. It's just the nature of gravity overhang. You're getting more pressure over this edge because center of gravity of this is moving towards the edge. If I come all the way over, I've got the full weight of it balanced here, almost no weight here. So that is just a given in lapping. Upper part is going to get on cave, bottom part is going to get convex. To counteract that, you can do this. Where now you've got your cutting action. This is getting all the cutting action. This is getting zero surface weight here, maximum out here. So you'll see guys spin the plate, and that's what they're doing. They're, they're working the outside edges so that they get them to wear down some also. That's actually working pretty hard right there. You don't want to spin too fast. You don't want to get up where it starts to build up. Even though it's heavy, you can build a hydrodynamic film there where, up there where... Okay, now it's starting to get sticky because I'm getting too much residue here and I need to clean off. also take a look at what's going on here by the hinging of this. Now, this is with the assumption that the plate is level. It is relatively flat. So you can see I'm not, I'm not pivoting out here. I'm hinging, but I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting closer to the hinging beam. So I'm going to do some more action with this. Flipping in. Once I've got where I see the plate is 
behave, I'll stop this action. Start to stick down there. Because I get too much residue. So as well, with all lapping, this is a this is being aware of all these factors that have an effect on how the lap wears, how the part wears, the cutting action of the abrasive, what kind of charge you have. That reason from all that I've read and seen, wet lapping is not the greatest. Uh, I mean, if you're doing lots of a lot of material removal and stuff, but final lapping, there is some moisture absorb or water absorption in granite. And if you're out for the nitty gritty, um, you need to be lapping dry. Now, there's nothing saying I couldn't lap dry or wet until I got to. But in my mind, all it's going to do is increase the hydrodynamic film and the float of the of the lap. So why bother? Now I'm going to do just straight straight line strokes again. Now that now that we see our our hinging on this is not too bad. So this I'm not I'm trying to not overhang much. Right this thing right here is right where we need a lot of raw material to do it. Just like in breathing, there's nothing saying I have to take this whole end down, but I have a hunch to put some holes in this end also. So rather than risk uh, doing a uh, stepping where I was just progressively work more and more on this end, so I didn't have to remove as much granite because there's a hole that's on the end. Uh, I'm just pointing that out as a technique, just like scraping where you progressively you mark out the path where each successive path is taking more and more uh, more and more distance, you know. The first cut, second cut, third cut, fourth cut, fifth cut, or vice versa. To the step you know, some control method of now I'm gonna go this direction so that I don't I think it's gonna loop and do from what I'm doing here with the I'm gonna do a long length of the lap to turn around that. That's a pickup from from uh, excess stuff. Go so far, and then it'll hit and and not be happening. And you get a little pickup here, where it smears. I don't exactly know why that happens. I don't know if, whether that's somewhat from the lanolin-based uh, plate cleaner, needing a little bit of oily residue that tends to pick up like that, or what. Hopefully, when this is a video, there'll be people, knowledgeable people, who might chime in and and uh, you know fill in the details of the real whys. I'm, I'm just hypothesizing here from my experience, and may or may not be valid. Now let's take hinge in here. Not too bad. I'm holding my hands, bare hands, on the top of this cast iron. Expanding the top and bowing this. I really should be wearing gloves or having insulation on there where I'm grabbing it, even though I don't see any of the lapping guys do that. Technically, this is the same thing I'd watch for, and if you're doing stuff with optical flats, you definitely have to watch for it. Your hand on top of the part you're lapping is going to temporarily deform it. And it might look good right while you're lapping, and then it pulls off. It changes. And then you're like, hey, I think it was quite a while ago. It was so thermally distorted. And you were measuring it in that state, and then it cooled off and got uniform temperatures throughout the whole cross section. It uh, went back to a different shape. Now, I, you can actually see better in this view from here. See that little our patches down there? That's uh, that's actually getting smaller pretty quick. So um, I'm going to keep going here. So I don't want to break out the Renzimeter during the rough process here because I need to really clean the plate before I do that. So I want something that I can do some rough checks just to see what my overall curvature is. Uh, the, the plate can be perfectly zero repeat reading, be a perfect sphere of very large radius, but be extremely concave or convex. So I need some hint of what I'm doing in that regard to know how to lap, meaning do I overhang the edges in, in my concave and I need to let the lap hang out more so that it starts to round the other direction. So quick and dirty method is to use my 
uh, precision level, two tenths per 10 inches uh, per division. And, but it's only a six inch square level. And I don't want to have to do a gazillion steps across here. So my Renzometer spacing is 5.5. So two of those is 11. And 11 works out to work out perfectly on the three foot by four foot. I can go 33 inches is um, three moves on the short side. 44 inches is four moves on the other side. So it cuts down. I can quickly see what's going on, which is what I'm after. So easy way to make this. I go over my stock rack. I look for something that's ready to go. I find a piece of precision ground stock ready to rip. Uh, so that it's reasonably parallel. I get four worn out inserts that are flat face inserts, no relief grooves or flat on the other side. They conveniently have a little pocket in the back to hold my Black Max 380. And they're on the surface plate, which is a good plane. So as these, when I flip this over, um, the plate's gonna basically hold them flat. So I'm not gonna have to lap these for the, for the purposes of what I'm doing. I have a magic marker mark here and here. I've already measured the distance between these and set them at 11 inches. I've spaced these for the uh, distance between them. Got a drip of Black Max ready to fall off there. So when I get that on there, I need a big enough drop that I know it's going to extrude out. Woo, that's definitely big enough. I hope I can glue it to the plate. Okay. And um, I have that space such that I'm going to visually line up the edge that's towards me of that on this edge here. And none of this is, is ultra precision. So, and I have the... Um, I have the plate, this has a little bit of a bow this way, so I'm actually going to glue this side down so that the when the level sits on here, it'll sit on two points instead of a bow. So I want it concave where the level's going to sit. So I'm just going to dust off these uh, spots here where the 380 is going to hit. And I'm just going to set this down on there and let the, uh, let the glue cure. So I'm just visually lining up with the edge of the plate and my magic marker mark here. And I'm just going to plant down and plunk it and let it go and let it sit by gravity. Now as that glue cures, it's inherently curing in whatever shape is necessary to fill in the gaps such that these feet are still good and flat. And like we said, this isn't ultra precision right now. This is however it sits, even if the feet aren't sitting perfectly flat on the table, if, you know, it's not 100% contact, doesn't matter. Just after a consistent reading such that when we move the level the three times, we can say, okay, uh, we're, you know, uphill like this, flat, uphill like this, or, okay, we're concave. Or the opposite, we're downhill like this, level, downhill, we know we're convex, and we can make our adjustments with the lapping. So I'm going to let this cure a few minutes. Okay, I changed my mind a little bit. I think I'm going to actually just use little tiny dabs of Black Max to glue this on, because I want to be able to lift it by the insulated grip. And I want really small dabs on there, because I don't want this to be, uh, you know, jackhammer removable. Well, I want to be able to snap it off. So there's our, there's our nice 11 inch foot spacing precision level that's going to allow me to assess the condition of the plate to a, actually to a darn accurate degree. Um, and the, remember here, the benefit here of the long spacing is minimal number of moves to see what's going on. But so here's the feet. You can see what's going on here, the actual foot right there, the style of insert I'm using. Not that that's important, but just a flat top. Since I just happened to have a lap sitting here, there's no harm in lapping the feet, so we've got somewhat reasonable contact. I don't have to be covering everywhere. Remember, this is just for a rough, a rough estimation, and obviously the glue didn't, uh, didn't. Um, put them down as level as I thought they would be. But this is plenty good enough for what we're doing. Okay, what am I doing here? This is centered on the plate. And what I have behind here is just some chunks of metal that equal the weight of this. I have two pieces of Kapton tape on here just to be a uh, non-harming foot rest for that. And I put that there because this is basically a technique to be a poor man's differential level. What I mean by that is when I go now to this position down here, which is the actual position, that center position won't actually be used. I will bring this down where its center of gravity is the same distance away from the center line as this to counteract the weight difference. Next move, I'll do the same thing. I'll go out to here and I'll come down to here where the center of gravity of that is this. And that is getting rid, not getting rid of, minimizing the deflection of the plate because of the weight variations. Remember, the pads that I put on here um, are 
pretty well designed to minimize the squish of the pads with the change of weight on the plate. But you still have the deflection of the actual metal frame. Everything moves with any changes of forces whatsoever. Everything's going to change its shape. So you just always have to be thinking that way. So this is how I'm going to do the poor man's uh, differential level. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back to center. And I'm going to put this on center. And then I'm going to just run the block down all the way to one end. So you can see the bubble move from a non-uniform movement. So the level's in the center of the plate. Now I'm just going to run its equivalent weight down to the far left. And I'm not changing my stance at all. I see that was shading our, our view here. You also have to be very careful with levels of your body heat. The vial, the shape of the vial that gives you this kind of sensitivity is very, very subtle. And just thermal changes, touching the vial with your finger or whatever, can, can change things. So we can see where we are right there. I'm going to come back. Not sure if we had any significant motion. Like I said, I did design this to be stiff as all get out the best I could. And you can see that that bubble is moving just a little bit to the left, not quite a half a division, maybe a third of a division to the left in that center position. And it does take time for the bubble to settle out. And remember here, we're not trying to calibrate this plate with this. Right now, I'm just simply trying to get a general feel for the shape of the plate so that I can adjust my lapping accordingly. I could be severely concave, I could be severely convex, I could be flat, I have no idea, but my, for any of those conditions, my lapping technique should change accordingly. So if we look at the right hand edge of that bubble, it's just peeking out just past that line, and the left hand edge of the bubble is just about half a division, it's just about in the middle there. So I'm going to move this down, and I'm not changing my position on the floor because my changing my position on the floor will change things also. And I think you can see, I need to shade that again because it's, there we go. I think you can see that bubble has now moved to where the right hand edge is now getting close to the halfway point and the left hand edge is getting close to just peeking out the, the edge. So we're looking at a good, uh, almost half a division, which is a tenth in that 11, roughly 10 inch. So just wanted to show you the principle, show you that the, that the actual me using this weight is going to help to calibrate this, not calibrate it, but to compensate for sh plate shift while I do this. So I'm going to start down here at this end, put this down here, line up my marks, take this down to the far end, six cents high, get this to zero. So now I'm going to move to the next one here, I'm going to come to here, Move this in to the so that center of gravity is splitting this difference here. Let the bubble settle. So relative to this being zero, this is minus two tenths. So this is curving uphill here. So now we're going to switch places from here, and here. This is a good plus four from here. So if this was zero, I'm using the zero for this side, this is plus four tenths. And then we move down our I need to stand back here to make sure I'm not influencing things from my way on the floor. Okay, that's a good four divisions. Excuse me. Three divisions. So this is plus six from here. So plus six added on to this plus four is plus a thousand. Okay. And then if we come over here and translate this from zero, this is minus two. So this becomes plus two tenths. And that would make this plus eight. Okay. So that's, that's the information I was after. I was being very careful not to overhang a lot. I can see that I need to overhang more because I'm now, plus I'm almost a thousandth high. So this thing is concave, one thousandth roughly. A thousandth here, eight tenths there. So I'm gonna duplicate this on the other side. I'm not gonna go through that again. You get the principle. You can see that we've used some techniques here to uh, mitigate the effects of weight on the, on the surface plate. That is one of the beauties of the uh, Renzimeter is that it has nothing to do with level. 
so I don't have to worry about any of that when I get this out. I just don't want to be, uh, remember, there's a lot of time spent on lapping the feet to be the exact same height, and um, I want that to be more of a finished instrument. This is telling us everything we need, need to know very quickly, no major math involved, and uh, lets me know where, what I need to do. So I'm going to do it crossways now so I can feel for that. Um, I'm just going to do those two and, and say, okay, that's enough for me to know what I need to do to change my technique. Now, from knowing that my ends are really high, both directions, the other end was uh, about four tenths in that distance. So, um, with that in mind, I'm going to overhang a bit more. But I'm going to have to be careful because as I overhang more, this plate is going to tend to get concave. So I'm going to need to do a lot more of the spin action to uh, have that not be the case. I'm actually going to go that direction to get the loose particles going that way. I did that is to I just dumped a pile of not a pile but significant amount of free braces there. I don't want that all piled there, so those long first strokes are to get some of that out of there. We've got more this way, so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go this way. I'm not gonna overhang get it right off the bat. Now to the plate, I'm keeping an eye on things, so that's actually good. Even though this plate even though this plate um is concave, uh, the lap is convex, which makes sense. So the overhang, when I stroke more overhang like this, should significantly more of the plate off the ends. It's like it helps to both bring the plate into being more convex. As with all things, scraping, whatever, lapping, you're not just going through the motions. You have to be thinking about the mechanics of what's going on. As you saw here, I needed to assess the curvature of the plate to change my technique. Uh, I think as much as that was out, um, I can do another another lap here. Yeah, just for the pilot, let's see what our, what our, and we're still we're still changing the center, which is good. I mean, we got room to move here, so I'm actually going to do a pass like this. Same thing. Okay, now what that tells me right there from my experience, a big smudge means that this is really filled with crud. See this? There's lots, a ton of the old granite dust there. As soon as you feel a pickup like that, I'm learning that this is a learning experience. I'm, I'm learning as I go here. Um, and that's the, what the kind of the attitude you have to take. You gotta assess what's going on. So I've learned now that you can't go too far. Now this has really got a charge. I can feel it with the microfiber. That, that's really, I really got some good diamond embedding in there. And this, this lap's starting to, to really 
really percolate. And remember, um, I don't, I'm, this isn't false humility. I'm simply applying techniques I know. The, I, I'm confident that I will get this plate flat, but the people that know what they're doing doing this may poo-poo some of what I'm doing. Just like anything else when you do it out of the clear blue, um, there are going to be things that you, you learn on the way, and the people that already know are watching and going, oh my god. Yeah. They're, they're screaming at the... At the uh, Screaming at the camera for the video, saying, no, no, don't do that. But, um, yeah, that's the way it is. And you, you just have to be kind of fearless in, in uh, taking this off. One of the great things is that hole that was here, this is almost like uh, probably a good eight tenths deep. That hole, it's almost gone. So in the process of this, we're going to see that. that uh, so I need to finish. I was in the process of doing the pass across here. I need to finish where I was. One thing I noticed is that the lap does pretty quickly lose its weight. Uh, we still got pretty good, pretty good bite here, but I'm going to wipe off stuff here. Try to not just keep driving over what I've just done to uh, minimize that thing packing up again and, and riding on the on the uh, dust. Three thumb. And you see how it's just paying attention? What's going on? Look how much has that changed. Our, our hinging points are getting inside down instead of on the center. So um, I'm actually going to uh, clean this off and see what we've done with that pass just to get a feel for it since this is relatively quick. So I could have just assumed that, oh, okay. Since that did that, and we lapped with the plate, everything should be the same. But you notice the first thing I did was the ends. I ran over the lengthwise to kind of get these edges down to, to a degree. And then I switched sideways and rolled over the edges. But it turns out that this curvature didn't change hardly at all. And I attribute that to fresh charge of diamond. We did all this. We heard that really <laughs> real high-pitched singing kind of cut. And then as I came to here, I started to get the drag and I can feel that I'm not getting as much of a cut. So I have to realize that, okay, this time now, to balance things, everything's a matter of balancing. I'm going to charge this this time and I'm going to do the sideways first. I'm going to overhang this edge, this edge, and do that. And that's that's the kind of things I'm talking about is really paying attention to what's going on because all those little nuances um, are what's going to be success or failure. I, I don't want guys um, not understanding that even I might be making this look easy, even though I don't really know what I'm doing. And I don't want people failing because they don't understand all of the details that I'm thinking about when I'm doing this. So at the risk of boring everybody to tears, yak and yak about what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, I'm doing it so that you realize that what makes people, what makes things look easy is when people understand the things that are going on and gears are turning and decisions are being made that you're not aware of. And I'm trying to tell you everything that's going through my mind, whether it's right or wrong, good or bad, but at least the train of thought's there so that when you're doing this, if you guys attempt this, and you should, go for it. What's the worst you can do? It's ruin a piece of granite. Um, and even that's not, I mean, you just, you just do it again. Fix it. So I'm just trying to um, make you aware of really paying attention. So I'm going to continue to just tell you my train of thought here. There we go. I'm learning this. If I'd done it all before, I would be telling you, okay, this is what I found to work the best. But you're going along for a ride because I don't have time to, to do it first and then come back and tell you. So I hope that uh, was educational or enlightening or you learned something or you realize you don't want to watch these anymore. Uh, whatever it was, um, I, I, uh, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, coming up is using a smaller lap, uh, using a lap where I line the face of the lap with aluminum foil because I'm noticing that it's not, just not the cast iron on these plates I think is a little hard. The plates I'm using, it's a little, little hard and it's not really um, able to hold a good charge. It works for a while, but it's mainly working with tumbling abrasion and the charge gets knocked out because it's not quite ductile and soft enough to, to hold the charge. 
So I'm trying aluminum foil uh, on there with some interesting results. And I'll be using uh, larger laps. I'll be trying my 18 inch square uh, uh, surface plates that I scraped for um, uh, three plate method learning. Uh, they're very flat and with the foil technique, I'll be able to actually line them and not ruin the surface plate uh, by charging it with diamond. And uh, there'll also be video coming up on the Renzi meter itself. So as we get to the stages where I'm going to be using the Renzi meter to actually calibrate the plate and make final fine tunings of the, getting the topography of this uh, plate uh, in condition, um, I'll be uh, using that and so you'll see a, a video on the uh, design construction and, and how that works. So um, hope you enjoyed these and this and uh, if you did, please subscribe, share, tell your friends and I'll be back.